Uh, hello, my name is Ali Menson and I'm Director of Pediatric Endoscopy at Columbia University Medical Center and uh, Director of GI Inpatient Services. Uh, this is Dr. Joseph Picararo, who is one of our fellows and is the first author on our paper that we'll be describing today that discusses our experience with gastrojejunal tube placement endoscopically. Um, Joe, could you share with us why we felt this was such an important study to uh, discuss? In patients with an established gastrostomy tract, GJ tubes can be placed endoscopically by a variety of techniques. We can drag the jejunal tube with the endoscope into the small bowel with forceps, or attach the tip of the jejunal tube to the small bowel with hemoclips. These techniques require sedation and can be technically challenging, especially in small patients. Interventional radiologists, on the other hand, can place GJ tubes fluoroscopically without sedation using a guide wire. Because of the relative ease of this technique, IR has become the mainstay of GJ2 placement at most pediatric institutions. However, there is an alternative endoscopic method which has not been well described in the pediatric literature. Ali, could you describe the technique of endoscopic transgastric gastrojejunal tube placement? I'd be glad to. First, we remove the existing gastrostomy tube or malfunctioning GJ2 from a mature gastrostomy site. The neonatal endoscope is then inserted through the gastric stoma and advanced to the distal duodenum or jejunum. A glide wire with a soft angled tip is then placed through the instrument channel into the small bowel under direct visualization. The scope is then withdrawn and the glide wire gently advanced to maintain its position in the jejunum. Once the scope is removed, a GJ tube can be advanced over the wire into place. We then injected Omnipake into the jejunal port to confirm adequate placement. This technique was first described in 2002 in adult intensive care unit patients, but there's been limited data in pediatric patients. The advantages of the technique are that it minimizes radiation exposure from fluoroscopy, can be performed without sedation, and most notably is much easier to perform than other endoscopic methods. After implementing the technique and gaining a substantial amount of experience with it, we knew it was an important alternative. For our study, we reviewed all procedures performed over a 16-month period using our technique. We collected information on patient demographics, medical history, use of sedation, fluoroscopy time, and procedural and post-procedural adverse events. If a patient had also undergone a GJ2 placement by interventional radiology, fluoroscopy time for those procedures were collected. And what did we find? A total of 47 GJ2 placements were performed, all of which resulted in successful two placement in the distal duodenum or jejunum. Fluoroscopy time ranged from 2 to 34 seconds, with a mean time of 10 seconds. In a subcohort of eight patients with GJ2 placements previously performed by interventional radiology, we analyzed their fluoroscopy time in IR compared to our endoscopic technique. The mean fluoroscopy time by the endoscopic method was 10 seconds versus almost 300 seconds by the interventional radiology method. In six patients, more than one endoscopic attempt was required due to coiling of the GJ tube in the stomach. Pyloric obstruction caused by the GJ tube balloon developed in one patient necessitating replacement with a smaller GJ tube. Sedation was used in 30% of placements. The important takeaway is that the experienced endoscopists can learn the technique with relative ease. They should, however, be mindful of a few important technical considerations. First, the gastric stoma size must be at least 14 French in diameter to allow for smooth passage of the neonatal endoscope. Second, it is easy to become disoriented when first scoping through the gastric stoma. Make sure you aim your scope in the direction of the pylorus and enter the pylorus without looping in the stomach. Third, once the guide wire is in place, it is critical to avoid pulling out the wire when the endoscope is withdrawn. You can prevent this by ensuring that the length of the wire inserted into the patient is longer than your GJ2 and that it is gently advanced under direct visualization at the same rate that the endoscope is withdrawn. Finally, slowly advance the GJ tube over the wire using a back and forth motion when encountering resistance and generously lubricate the wire and outer aspect of the tube to promote movement of the tube into place. 
This should prevent looping in the stomach. Stomach loops are a problem because they can act as a traction point for the tube to get pulled back into the stomach. If you get a loop, try reducing the loop by pulling out the tube and then try to re-advance slowly. You can also re-scope the patient. So Joe, do you think this technique is really any better than existing techniques? It certainly has important advantages over existing endoscopic methods. First, it minimizes the needs for sedation and in 70% of our cases no sedation was necessary. Minimizing exposure to sedatives and anesthetic agents is paramount in children due to the potential to impair cognitive development. Though the procedure itself can cause minor discomfort, such as hiccups, pain around the stoma site, and abdominal distension from insufflation, patient anxiety is the primary limitation in performing the procedure in a pediatric patient. By providing plate therapy in addition to parent presence during the procedure, we were able to overcome this problem in most cases. Second, Radiation was limited, which is important given the potential consequences of radiation exposure in children, and that many of these patients will require multiple replacements. In contrast to GJ tubes placed by IR, endoscopically placed GJ tubes utilize fluoroscopy primarily to confirm placement, and in experienced hands, may even be performed without it. In a subcohort of our patients who underwent a fluoroscopic placement by interventional radiology, Fluoroscopy exposure during the IR procedure was significantly more. So what's next, Ellie? Now that we have described our experience with this technique, prospective evaluation of larger cohorts is necessary to validate our findings. Future studies should directly compare endoscopic transgastric GJ2 placement with other techniques to determine the contribution of factors that could affect technique-related outcomes, including clinical indication for GJ2 placement, gastrointestinal anatomy, and prior surgery. It would also be valuable to evaluate other factors such as tube lifespan and long-term issues related to GJ tubes. To conclude, we demonstrated that endoscopic transgastric placement of GJ tubes with fluoroscopic confirmation is safe, effective, and reliable, limiting sedation compared to other endoscopic methods, and limiting radiation exposure compared to tubes placed by interventional radiology. It is an important alternative method that can be performed independently by pediatric gastroenterologists. Given its advantages, it could become the mainstay method of GJ2 placement in pediatrics. Please read our full article on gastrointestinal endoscopy for more details. Thank you.